I wish will, to welcome you today at the 2020 symposium sponsored by the Antelope Valley East Kern STEM Network in conjunction with Edwards Air Force Base Hybrid Aerospace Valley Air Show. The event's theme for this year's event is STEM and Advanced Manufacturing in an Ever-Changing World. This event will be from October 5 through the 8th, and it will be held daily from 3 o'clock in the afternoon to 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Let me just give you a brief background about the Antelope Valley East Kern STEM Network. We promote the rapidly growing and competitive fields of science, technology, engineering, and math, STEM, that create a challenging and engaging inquiry-based learning environment. Through robust collaboration and partnership with the aerospace industries, educational institutions, and the Air Force that required STEM prepared workforce. Our mission is to grow and maintain a diverse, progressive, and innovative STEM workforce within the Greater Antelope Valley East Kern STEM Network. Through educational programs and strong dynamic community partnerships, and to establish a unified voice for STEM policy and activities throughout the region. The schedule for the event consists of various speakers from the state of California educational institutions and the aerospace industries. Starting today, we're gonna have opening remarks by Brigadier General Matthew Heiger of the United States Air Force, the commander of the 4th 12th Test Wing, followed by Master Sergeant Greenwall, uh, entitled 3D Printing Technology Applications During the COVID-19. And this is followed by Palmdale High School Solar Falcon Race Team presentation. October 6, it will be presented and moderated by Mr. Duane Robinson. October 7th, it will be presented and uh, intro introduced by Mr. Scott Hampton. And the last day, it will be introduced and welcomed by Mr. Randy Scott. All these days will consist of various speeches, and you will get a chance to meet speakers from the aerospace industry, as well as from the educational institutions here in the Greater Antelope Valley. Our next segment today is posting of the colors, followed by an opening remarks to be delivered by Brigadier General Matthew Heiger of the United States Air Force. We are honored this year event 
to introduce our honorary speaker, Brigadier General Matthew Heiger, who is the commander of the 4th World Test Wing. He leads a wing of nearly 8,000 personnel in the developmental test and evaluation wings. Additionally, he is the installation commander responsible for the base operations support for more than 19,500 active duty, reserve, civil service, and defense industrial base contractors at Edwards. Edwards Base it is considered the second largest base in the United States Air Force and Air Force Plant 42 in Palmdale, California. General Heiger earned his commission in 1993 from the Air Force Reserve Officer Training Corps at the University of Southern California, and he is distinguished graduate of the United States Army War College, the United States Naval Postgraduate School, and the United States Air Force Squadron Officer School, as well as the Air Force Reserve Officer Training Corps. General Heiger holds a level three acquisition, professional development program certification in program management and test evaluation. Also, he was previously the commandant of the United States Air Force Pilot School, vice commander of the 96th Test Wing and commanded two squadrons. We are very proud of having General Heiger to be our honorary speaker for this event. Please enjoy the symposium event and Edwards Air Show. Thank you so much. Dr. Khalil, thank you very much for that introduction and uh, everybody welcome to this year's 2020 symposium. Uh, you'll note that uh, one of the things that we are highlighting this year at Edwards Air Force Base in the Aerospace Valley Hybrid Air Show uh, is that we can innovate. And that innovation is in our DNA. In fact, I argue sometimes that it's, it's either in the water or the, the air or the soil or maybe all three uh, from an innovative uh, perspective here at Edwards Air, Air Force Base and in the, the larger aerospace valley. Uh, our, our initial plans for this air show and frankly for this stem, symposium were to have a, a very large on-base presence uh, and bring a lot of these uh, components, discussions, topics, and speakers to you, the audience, uh, in a manner that was, uh, you know, up on stage with folks at microphones and, and a lot of face-to-face -face interaction. So to the extent that the moderators can, can hit that today or this week, I encourage you to do so. Uh, one of the things that I want to highlight is that uh, while our pandemic or this pandemic that we're fighting through or that we're fighting with or that we're trying to establish the new normal in, uh, shut down a lot of these activities and these options and these operations across the, the nation, all for very valid reasons. Uh, organizations like the Aerospace Valley, uh, like uh, STEM County, East STEM County uh, STEM Initiative and Edwards Base itself all innovated, we pivoted, we, we adapted. And I think that type of agility and that type of adaptation are an exceptional uh, characteristic that is present in almost everything we do every day in the larger Aerospace Valley and at the center of the Aerospace Testing Universe. So it's, it's a privilege for me to be here today uh, speaking to you and giving you a few thoughts on what STEM means to me and what STEM has meant to me personally and uh, what I see for that in the future. Uh, so with that, as my, uh, I'll say my initial salvo, uh, the, the topic that we're trying to get through today is the, the topic of uh, STEM and ad advanced manufacturing. And here in a little while, you're going to hear uh, one of my favorite folks to spend time and talk to talk about additive manufacturing and how we've been able to use that in our fight against COVID. So in the early days where we were concerned about, very concerned about touch transmission and how we got around that or pivoted away from having a whole bunch of people touch a whole bunch of things like door handles to other things that we're doing in additive manufacturing here at Edwards and in an innovative lab that we call Makerspaces. So I'm not gonna take any more of that. Uh, I'll leave that as a teaser or a, or a precursor to Master Sergeant Greenwell's uh, discussion here in a few minutes. But uh, I, I do want to talk to you a little bit about what, uh, what this hour means to me, this hour today, Monday through Thursday. It's an hour where this symposium, a STEMposium focused on science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, 
and, and you can put a, a second M or a, a squared after the M and, and throw in medical in many cases too. Uh, it, it means a lot to me because these types of topics and these types of forums are exactly what uh, Edwards needs. They're what our Air Force needs. They're what the Department of the Air Force needs. Uh, they're important to our community. But I will say most importantly, a refocus or, or an encouragement or a like minds together thinking and talking about and getting excited about STEM are very important for the nation. So I, I like a historical reference as a, as a, when I give a speech like this, and I'll give you the historical reference to the, the speech by a former president, uh, John F. Kennedy, when he gave his speech of let's go to the moon. Uh, he was literally saying, let's put an American on the moon. And we did that in, in 1969. But the bigger topic was competition. Uh, as you recall, if you've studied history or if you remember that period in history, we were in a race. We were in a race with a peer competitor. And one of the ways to make sure that our nation stayed ahead of or got further ahead of that adversary was to encourage folks at all levels and in all stages of life and career and education to get excited about ways they could use their interest and talent and get into uh, fields and places and groups and, and push forward what we understand about the physical world, uh, how we answer questions like, how do we do that? Or why, why can't we do that? And uh, that was a big national push that resulted in a large advance across many career fields and many institutions uh, from kindergarten all the way through PhDs that really pushed the state of the art in science. It pushed the art in engineering uh, and it, we used the get a man on the moon as an example of a, of a pinnacle moment there. But along the way, we learned so much and we advanced so much. Uh, I believe strongly, I assert strongly that a large benefit of that big national push for science, technology, engineering, uh, founded in the cornerstones of the language known as mathematics, uh, was very much responsible for, or at least a necessary prerequisite, of the advances that our nation had economically, militarily, and geopolitically in the 70s, 80s, 90s, and even into the early uh, 21st century. And so uh, it's important to me to, to remind everybody how important it is for us to, to stay involved and stay focused as we compete, as we compete with peer competitors around the globe, economically, geopolitically, and yes, militarily as well. Uh, one of the ways that uh, we compete is we we think, we get together, we're agile, we, we, we talk about science and we question why things are. Uh, we become engineers. Uh, I have a couple engineering degrees myself and I love solving problems. If that sounds interesting to you, then engineering may be your thing. Uh, if you like pure science or you like knowing the, 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 the pure answer on the why, science may be your thing. But maybe you're not interested in higher education at all, and, and, but technology interests you. Right? There are a lot of things you can do in STEM or STEM related fields where you need to have a basic understanding of science, engineering, physics and mathematics, but maybe you just want to do tech. So an example of tech that we're going to hear from later is uh, additive manufacturing, but there are a whole bunch of other things you can do in the technology fields. Think uh, information technology or some, some uh, network administrators or, or computer programming or gaming, virtual reality, those kinds of things. Those are all tech and technology based and any advances in all of those fields and more is very important to our nation. It's also very important to the, the community that we live in, in the aerospace Valley and many other communities that you live in across America. I can think of a lot of technology hubs and places. One that gets a lot of press is Silicon Valley, but there are others. Uh, hubs around Wright-Patterson Air Force Base are another one. And there are pockets like that throughout the United States. Um, Huntsville, Alabama is another great location of a community that has a large focus and a large investment and a large commitment to STEM and STEM education. So uh, with that in mind, I wanna talk a little bit about uh, what STEM means to Edwards and, and how we are getting after uh, exposing folks to STEM and making sure they understand what STEM opportunities are available. And this STEM posing is a great example. The hybrid air show is another partner in that and another example of that. You'll note that uh, we kept the name air show, but uh, there are a lot less acrobatic or super dynamic maneuvers that are going to happen on uh, Friday and Saturday for the air show. But we do want to show and we do want to highlight that uh, aircraft and aerospace vehicles um, in a more general term are a big part of what we've advanced and what we continue to lead the world on here. And much of that happens in the aerospace valley. You know, I, I, I knew this, but I didn't realize just how important and how impactful it was 
that the combination of Rogers Dry Lake Bed, Munich Dry Lake Bed, and Edwards Air Force Base, and its co-location with places like Air Force Plant 42 and all of our uh, defense industrial base partners there, what we've contributed just in my lifetime to the advancement. You know, all the all the space shuttles that were ever flown were final assembled at Plant 42. Uh, other big projects and big programs have uh, come to life at Plant 42 and then been tested at Edwards and then been upgraded or modified or gone through heavy maintenance back at Plant 42. And that that synergy between Plant 42 and uh, Edwards Air Force Base and the larger aerospace valley, I think is really important. It also highlights that there's pretty much anything you wanna do uh, from a job or from a career perspective, from manufacturing uh, or maintenance of, of flying aircraft or other types of uh, broader uh, base support, all the way up through very high level, uh, multiple advanced degrees required research and engineering uh, topics. You can teach a test pilot school, you can be a test flight test engineer, you can uh, do the, uh, the, the flight test itself, you can support that. You can be uh, a technologically advanced and informed uh, security forces or Air Force uh, policemen. You can uh, could work with or be a partner with one of our aerospace defense partners. The, the major contributors at Plant 42 are Boeing, Lockheed Martin, and Northrop Grumman. There's also a lot of uh, partnership that we have uh, in sharing resources and advances and uh, people and, and the brain trust in the Valley with the folks that are at the Mojave Air and Spaceport. Uh, I have in all looked at what's happened at the Mojave Air and Spaceport as they have uh, turned it into a spaceport the last five to 10 years. It's also very impressive and a, and a really exciting thing to be a part of. Uh, all that rolls up to me, to me and to my predecessor as well, uh, to really drive home that this is really the center of the aerospace testing universe and aerospace is the, the important thing there. So as you think about and as you look at uh, what you want to do going forward, uh, use uh, weeks like this week to, to think about if you're in your if you're in uh, in grade school, middle school, or high school, to think about these options, keep them open. Uh, if you are beyond that and you're interested in uh, expanding your career or growing your career, or changing your career, there's a lot in STEM that uh, I think is going to appeal to overwhelmingly most of us. If you have any interest whatsoever, and if you uh, enjoy. This, uh, this line of work and this environment and these types of organizations, there is guaranteed something and, and someone in some place to contribute here for you. Uh, so with that, uh, I wanna put in one more, uh, one more highlight for the uh, uh, Antelope Valley, or rather the Aerospace Valley Eastern STEM Association, the, the network. Uh, there are a couple ways that you can get into that network. Uh, one is contacting the uh, STEM uh, coordinator here on Edwards Air Force Base, Ms. Alita Van Hoy. Uh, you can this uh, this entire uh, STEM and education things that are happening this week are really due to her and the team that she leads, and that's one uh, one exciting opportunity and one great uh, benefit we have about having this this community that is so so um, so committed to the education and the advancement of technology. Uh, and and so on those lines. Uh, it, I don't know if we can get to any questions. I see three hands up. So if the moderator could get those to me, that'd be great. But uh, if we can't do that, I'll, uh, I'll offer that um, I'm happy to answer questions in any form that we can have, and I'll be monitoring the rest of today and, and the majority of the air show. Uh, I encourage all of you to uh, stay tuned and, and stay interested and let us know what you got out of this, what we could have done a little bit better, where, where it wasn't just exactly what you were hoping for. And then a year from now, in 2021, uh, we will have another symposium associated with and affiliated with the Aerospace Valley um, Air Show. And then in 2022, we're going to have an air show and a symposium back on Edwards Air Force Base as we celebrate the 75th anniversary of the breaking of the sound barrier by the airplane that's right over my shoulder here, the X-1. And that will also be the 75th anniversary of the United States Air Force. Uh, and, and I think that's a, it's a good thing to look forward to next year and, and two years after that. But most importantly, and I'm so excited about it, uh, there's a lot more here than just one base, one mission, one airplane, and, and the history here. Uh, a lot of what we have to look forward to is what you're going to do, what you're going to be involved in, the questions you're going to ask, the things you're going to solve as you use science, uh, and as you become a part of the technology spectrum, as you become an engineer or use engineering principles to, to solve problems or, or figure out solutions to, to make things better than they were before. And lastly, to uh, stay involved in math and, and other uh, academic subjects so that you have a good understanding of the basis of the language required as we talk in the STEM fields. 
And uh, lastly, if, uh, if you don't want to do something hardcore uh, technology that's related to airplanes or things, there's also other science and technology in the medical fields and other things like that, which are certainly applicable as we try to put humans back in space, back on the moon, and potentially go to Mars as a race and, and do other things uh, extraterrestrial. Um, lots of my friends and lots of my classmates along the way are now in the United States Space Force. And uh, a recent, uh, recent uh, astronaut, uh, I heard a quote from him that uh, he asked to be a good friend of mine, a classmate of mine. He said, uh, you know, if you decide your purpose on this earth is to, to spend a little time off this earth, then uh, give us a call in the Department of the Air Force, the Space Force and the Air Force. Um, what's the common theme to everything you've heard me talk about for your future? Uh, the common theme to your future uh, that is, is across all of these topics and at every grade level, to include if you're done with your school, is to stay involved academically, do well, get good grades, uh, continue to advance yourself and progress. And along those lines, there's, we have a lot in common with the, Stern, the um, Aerospace Valley East Kern STEM Network and the STEM programs that are on Edwards Air Force Base. Uh, not just the 412 STEM, but also the NASA STEM program that is at the Armstrong F Flight Research Lab. So with that, uh, I'm gonna let you get on with uh, the presentation uh, about additive manufacturing that we're doing in our maker spaces here at Edwards Air Force Base as just one example of a place where you can use the engineering thought process and the engineering solve a problem with the technology that other folks have generated and left for us to figure out new uses with, and that is 3D printing and 3D manufacturing. Folks, I uh, wish you the best, and uh, I'll sign off for uh, this session, but uh, enjoy the time with the rest of us here at Takata 2, and be well. Hi, thanks, General Heiger. We appreciate that. Uh, I'm Chris Vanderheide from the AV Eastern STEM Network, and uh, I'm here today to introduce uh, Master Sergeant Jason Greenwell, yep. from a career advisor. So uh, take it away, Master Sergeant Greenwell. Okay. I'm Sergeant Greenwell, Chris. This is advisor at Edwards Air Force Base. Uh, my uh, other job is in electronic warfare. Before I took on the career this advisor role, I was uh, working the flight line, uh, avionic systems uh, on the bombers. Uh, so I want to talk uh, briefly just about how we used additive manufacturing uh, to uh, help to contribute to the battle against COVID. So when COVID first kicked off, we had no idea um, how to uh, protect ourselves against that. Um, there was some very little science out there, very little research, very little information out there. Uh, but what we found was, is that there's a potential that we can extend the life of the N95 mask by applying a shell or a cover over that mask. So um, I got a team together, uh, Tech Sergeant Gaines and uh, Senior Airman Cortez are not here with us right now, but uh, we got a team together and we uh, started to uh, create uh, different masks, mask types, mask uh, styles, and things like that. We found on a lot of the open source sites, uh, there was a lot of uh, what we call STL files that existed already uh, to cover the N95 mask and protect it. Um, so we started out with some, uh, some low-res uh, res, low res, um, prototyping, where we first started by building uh, our prototypes on paper, uh, drawing it out and sitting around and kind of talking about it, talking about the, uh, uh, some of the pros and cons of each type of mask. And sometimes uh, we would take files off of the internet and see how we can improve upon that mask by either adding something or taking something away from it. Um, so that process took us, I don't know, a few days or so uh, of sitting around and just really uh, going through that process. The next step was we 3D modeled um, these designs that we came up with on paper and we had a big concept board uh, that we came up with these designs on, and we would 3D model them. Tech Sergeant Gaines is our 3D modeling expert. Uh, he took that over uh, in a program called, and I had to write this down because I'm not a, I'm not a 3D <laughs> model expert or video game design or anything like that, but uh, Maya was the program that he used to take our concept from paper to a 3D model where we can also simulate that um, and, and see what was the best type of mask, the best cover for an N95, uh, et cetera. Uh, from the 3D modeling stage, and, uh, and again, looking at some of the pros and cons of each design and each mask type, uh, we went over to the 3D print stage, where we used various materials from PLA to PETG. Um, and during this entire process, we probably used, uh, I, I'd say, uh, three or four different types of materials. Um, and we also, uh, because the, we knew that the mask at some point needed to be decontaminated, uh, we took some of the 
chemicals that we knew that uh, would be used in the decon process and tested each of those materials that we used to print these masks out um, to determine uh, how quickly they break down, if they break down at all, uh, et cetera. So, uh, a question. Uh, so, had you worked with the medical community at all or, or to see if this is an accepted uh, practice in, the, in that community? Or? Good question. We haven't worked directly with the medical community, but uh, we did find some information on some of their websites that they had been successful in using things like the face shield, for example, which we also 3D printed and kind of improved upon uh, and even 3D printed a, a model that uh, you could use a standard two liter bottle of Coke or what have you, clean it out, cut it in half, and then place it over the, the shield or, or the um, headband piece um, and then cover your face with that Coke bottle. In case we ran out of plastic material, you can go buy a standard uh, Coke bottle and use that as the face shield. That's awesome. Uh, so what would you say to students who are looking at trying to design a model and, and get it out into a community, and get it out in, and, mm -hmm. and accepted by somebody? Okay, good question. So I, and I forget the name of the, the, the website, but there are several open source websites where you can, uh, if you're good with 3D modeling, or I would say first learn uh, 3D modeling, there's several programs out there. I know that Microsoft has a th uh, Paint 3D application now where you can start off there. Uh, but I would say uh, learn the 3D modeling piece, uh, and then once you've get, gotten good at the 3D modeling piece, uh, then there's several open source websites out there to submit your designs to to get picked up. There's even some I think that uh, you can ask for a fee or or even get a, maybe make some money off of it. But uh, there are some sites out there that you can upload your 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 um, information or your STL files in this case if you're doing 3D printing, but um, that you can upload your models to. So. So since you're a career advisor, let me uh, go back to what would students do to look at being an enlist, getting in the enlisted Air Force? Oh, good question. So, uh, well, the first step is, uh, is to uh, seek out the recruiter, yeah. uh, seek out the recruiter to come in. But I would say uh, uh, enlisting and going on the enlisted side, focus on the, on the uh, studying a little bit for the ASVAB. Um, and then the officer side is the AFOQT. Uh, ROTC is also a good path. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then um, would, would going to college at all or be help or is that something that they can do later on once they get into the Air Force? Absolutely. Well, so it's ultimately up to, up to the student. So um, and when, once you come enlisted, you can always cross over to be an officer or stay enlisted. Um, coming in the enlisted side, I think, uh, uh, was a good decision for me. I, I came in when I was 17 years old, and, but I'll, I knew that I was going to get that education and, and knock that education out. So. Um, uh, Education-wise, enlisted side, your, your education will be taken care of all the way up to a master's degree, um, almost without coming out of pocket. And then uh, on the officer side coming in, um, you would already have a bachelor's degree uh, coming in directly as an officer from, uh, from a university. Okay, we have a question from okay. Gabriella Sereno. Okay. It was, how long did the model take to make? So we printed out several models. Uh, there weren't just, there wasn't just one model, but... Um, it dependent the, on the model and how um, how intricate it was, but I think uh, the longest one took three hours. Uh, and the reason why it took three hours is because it was very intricate and it it modeled uh, a pilot's mask uh, essentially, and it covered the whole face. Um, and it had like a, it was a two piece design where it was a it was a pressure fit to fit a filter in the front. So uh, because that was a multi multi piece and very intricate piece, uh, that one took uh, about three hours to print. Uh, on a 3D printer, but it also depends on the type of 3D printer you have. Uh, if your 3D printer um, is is a hobby, you know, 3D printer um, that could take longer than a than a, a professional 3D printer. Um, but then we have some pieces that were just flat, and they literally took about 20 minutes to print, 20 to 30 minutes, and so uh, we were able to get those printed out pretty quickly. Uh, but in order to to 3D print these things, and then uh, and I guess manufacture them and, and deliver them. Uh, we would have had to have anywhere from 20 to 30 of these 3D printers that we had uh, to, to push them out to the community at a rate that's acceptable. Great. Uh, Jose Perez asks, how has making mistakes improved or influenced the quality or makeup of your end product or solution? Awesome. Uh, so I always 
we, we failed, <laughs> we failed quite a bit. Uh, we made a lot of mistakes, uh, and those mistakes have uh, basically we learned uh, what to do and what not to do. Uh, uh, that's the easy answer, I guess, is, is we learn what, what works and what does not work. And in the end, because we're doing, um, this is still what I would consider low resolution prototyping where the, the material is not expensive. Uh, some PLA, a roll of PLA might cost you $50, but you'll get, depending on what you're printing out, you'll get several hundred, several thousand sometimes uh, prints out of a roll. Um, so it wasn't expensive. But, uh, but because it's low resolution and low cost, uh, it allowed us to uh, be able to fail and be comfortable with failing. So how did, how did uh, your ultimate solution get accepted by uh, the community? Okay, so we, we published the solution uh, and at first we used Google Drive uh, and then it just kind of caught fire from, uh, we have a uh, Facebook page that we posted it to and then several people got, um, got the links and then shared it as things go. Um, it, uh, it, I guess you could say it went viral within the maker community, uh, at least uh, among the Air Force maker communities. And then uh, people picked it up and, and, and took off with it. Um, when people learned that there was a, a drive out there that was made by, uh, by Edwards Air Force Base, so that was, had a lot of files and research information and things like that in it, um, some leadership learned about it and uh, I, I gave them access to it and, um, and they used that information to hopefully guide their decision on our mitigation factors. That's great. Uh, so, what would you say was your uh, the most uh, important thing in your career that that spurred you on to this moment? Well, um, you know, honestly, I've I've been in the STEM field um, since I would say twelve years old because I've been programming since I was twelve years old. Um, I mean, I started out with with BASIC. If anybody's familiar with the BASIC programming language, then I. Uh, kind of went up to C and C sharp and C plus plus and et cetera. Uh, so I'd already kind of had a, a foot into the uh, STEM field. We didn't call it STEM then. It was just, it just called you a nerd. So, uh, but I, um, uh, in my career though, uh, being in the Air Force, I, I, and especially in my regular job, which is electronic warfare, I got to see a lot of cool things and it just really kept me interested in the sciences. Um, and so I went on to get a degree in computer science and then uh, masters in uh, systems engineering, and then I just continue to learn every day. Uh, I'm doing a lot of uh, the online classes, and YouTube is an excellent source for, for things. I wish I had it when I was growing up, um, but um, but yeah, I mean, in, in the in the career, just just being in the Air Force and seeing a lot of cool things, just always kept me interested in learning more about that thing. I couldn't just go through and say, "Hey, that this thing works and it's cool." I I needed to know how it works internally, so. So how has this project uh, influenced your current career and possible future possibilities of career? Uh, so that's, that's hard to say, um, but uh, I guess this, this project, um, so how has it influenced my career and then in the future? Well, yeah, how, what, what would, is it gonna, is it opened up a new future for you basically? Uh, well, I hope so, but um, it, um, yes, I mean, it, it has 3D printing, for example, uh, that was not something that I knew anything about. Um, I actually learned from my teammates, and um, now I can take that, when I go back to my original career field shortly, I can take that knowledge and potentially make, my, make the career field better or, or help advance the career field potentially as well. And so what is your career field, and, and how do you think that's going to apply uh, to mm. to your future, and then ultimately once you get out and get a, get another career? Yeah. Um, so my, again, my career field is electronic warfare or avionic systems uh, technology, avionic systems maintenance, uh, specifically on the bombers. But um, you know, I, like I said, I think just having a little knowledge here, a little knowledge there about these different STEM-related topics really helps enhance what I already know about electronic warfare, for example. And uh, my aim is to just is to ultimately, I mean, I'd like to make it to the chief master sergeant rank and and uh, help t some of the knowledge that I have now to improve, again, the career field or improve the Air Force in some way. Great. Mm -hmm. uh, well, thanks, Master Sergeant Greenwell. Thank we appreciate uh, all you've done. 
Uh, we'll be watching a video right after this for the uh, Solar Falcon race team. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, and welcome to the Palmdale High School Engineering Academy Solar Falcon Race Team presentation. My name is Beatrice Patino. I'm the CEO of the team. My name is Kimberly Amador, and I am CFO for the team. We oversee the entire team, coordinate all activities and events, process all purchases, registrations, and reservations. The Solar Falcon Race Team has designed, built, and raced roadworthy cars. Our solar cars competed in five national races, placing asphalt in the solar car division, seventh, third, fifth, second, and fourth. Last year was our electric car's first race, and it came in fifth place in the electric car division. The team is divided into four companies, electrical, automotive, fabrication, and media. These companies collaborate on all phases in designing, building, and racing our cars. Hello, my name is Sebastian King, and I am the solar car racing team captain, as well as the electrical lead. My name is Luis Lazaro. I'm the automotive lead for the solar car. Once again, my name is Beatrice Patino, and I'm also the fabrication lead. My name is Valerie Garcia, and I'm lead for media. For the solar car, here are some of the current redesigns and remodifications. In electrical, we are switching to a smaller and lighter but heavier due to motor. We are adding a fifth solar panel, which is going to increase the energy input by 25%. And we are relocating and re. Uh, rewiring some of the electrical components to make better efficient use of space. For automotive, we are increasing the mechanical advantage of the gear ratio, replacing chain sprockets and rear wheel for a lighter, more efficient design. For fabrication, we're working on the redesign and refabrication of the solar array frame to make it lighter and easier to tilt, the removal of as much weight from non-essential frame parts and the design and realignment of the motor mount. For our media, we are improving the quality of photos and videos, having more photos for yearbook, doing more social media posts and getting more sponsorships. Hello, my name is Diana Castro and I'm the electric car racing team captain and I'm also the lead for fabrication. Hello, my name is Vicky Hugo Amaro, and I'm the automotive lead for the electric car. Hello, my name is Lauren Kell, and I am the lead of the electrical company for the electrical car. Hello, my name is Pedro Montes Yoka. I am the lead for media for the electric car. Here are some electric car redesign and modifications. For fabrication, we plan to remove unnecessary non-structural frame components to lighten up the car and redesign and refabricate the rear placement of the motor. In automotive, we plan to change the gear ratio from the motor to the wheel, correct alignment issues, and redesign and replace the sprocket for a better mechanical advantage. For the electrical improvements, we will be replacing the motor with a new one and we will be relocating and rewiring the electrical components for a better placement and more use of the space. Our improvements for media would be having better qualities for videos and photos, more photos for the yearbook and social media, and getting more sponsorships. These are our teams by the company they represent. These are some of our sponsors. Thank you so much for your attention. Are there any questions? Thanks everybody for coming today. We just appreciate you uh, joining us for the uh, Aerospace Valley Air Show and uh, in support of STEM. We thank you and join us for tomorrow.
uh, it starts at 8 a.m. for the uh, morning sessions. And then again, we will have our symposium session starting at 3 p.m. So thanks, everybody.